I think we all understand the fleet sector has to make a fair tax contribution to pay for schools, hospitals, reducing the national debt. What we at the BVLA are really, really work, worked up about is unfair, unjustified, and quite often ill-informed tax policy that we believe requires much greater challenge. And today what I want to do is provide you an overview, um, looking at both the autumn statement and, and going back a few years, to give you a sort of a direction where the company fleet tax landscape is going and how it's been changing and why we strongly believe the government needs to continue to invest um, in this sector to help lay the foundations to have a much stronger UK. I mean, the transport sector has always evolved. But what I've noticed is the speed at which things are changing. And what's different, I think comparing it to previous years, it's, it's vital now that, than ever before. And in fact, it's imperative that we have very well clear, signalled, tax policy landscape and it allows you to help plan ahead. So first of all, if I was looking, just going back the last sort of 10 years, again this is based on UK government data. And just over the last 10 years you can see on the left we had 1.2 million company car drivers and that's fallen and why it's a bit plateaued in the last six years but that's fallen by 21%. So we've got 21% fewer company car drivers in the marketplace. And that, in real terms, is a drop. Because when you look at the growing economy, you would expect that figure to start rising. That actually is falling. And again, when you look at the red line, it's from the left, that's when, at the, high, at the scale of 2011, the government was getting £4.2 billion in taxation. And it's dropped to its lowest point to £3.6 billion. And that hasn't happened by accident. That's because the market is responding to the government's investment of driving greener and cleaner vehicles. So the greener we get, the less tax we pay. But as you start to see, that's starting to rise. And that's been rising over the last sort of three to four years. Again, when we look at the average tax charge, the typical vehicle on, on the company car fleet, that's actually... Three point, on the left, it's at £3,500 per annum, and that's been rising as well. And we'll explore the reasons why that's been rising. It's gone up to just coming up to £4,000 per annum. So looking at the first range of tax, and again, for those that have good memories in the room, we had the abolition of Qualex, the low, qualifying low emission vehicles, the ones that are below 110 grams. It was a, a, an abolishment of those. Then back in March 2015, we had a rapid adjustment of the lowest CO2 vehicles. And again, for those that saw referencing the diesel gate, we saw an opportunistic move by the government in the budget to remove, retain rather, the 3% the diesel supplement, which it signaled to the market it was going to remove. When you aggregate that, that is a £740 million tax rise on the sector. And again, going back to the points we've been looking at, that, that's not well signalled. The market needs to plan ahead. Once we understand tax need to raise, it's about fair treatment. So if we look ahead, what's been going on, reflecting just back recently on the autumn statement, we've been, as, as Jerry touched on earlier, on, we've been extremely busy looking at the, the changes around salary sacrifice. Again, I think the title of that consultation was misleading because when we talked to most members and, and when they were talking to their customers, they, they thought it doesn't affect them, because they're not, but it affected a much larger pool, particularly those um, employees that have access to um, cash allowance. So again, what did we hear? The, so it's, a lot of activity went behind the scenes. Members, and that was a good example of where members collaborated together. We've got good quality data, which we were able to put a compelling case to government. And again, this is quite an interesting, when you looked at that consultation, there was no impact assessment, there was no cost-benefit analysis. It was, it was almost as if the government didn't really understand the subject it was about to tackle. So I think it was a good example where we took the fight to the government to help them understand the issues. 
So out of that, what they've announced is there will be no changes until April 2017. So they're giving us very clear notification of the changes ahead. Again, for any contracts that are entered into before that day are going to be protected until 2021. So again, they're giving us long grandfather protected rights in that. Again, that's very much welcomed. So after April 2017, there's a carve out for vehicles that emit less than 75 grams. They will be unaffected by the change. They, those products can carry on um, unchanged. But those that aren't, aren't caught in that carve out it only impact the employer's NI. So again, for those that are either taking the higher of the two, if it's a benefit in kind or it's the cash allowance alternative, that's how they'll be affected going forward for any cars that are over that 75 gram. But again, we need to look at the details. The, the details are going to be published on Monday on the 5th of December. And again, we'll need to really understand those changes. And again, we, we had a meeting yesterday amongst members, and it was very clear that, that even in the finance bill, there'll be areas which are ambiguous, so we do need to make sure we work with government to get a bit more clarity so that you can give good, solid advice to your customers about the changes. And again, we know, as you've heard today from Nick, that 75 grams is not going to remain at 75 grams. So I suppose we need a grown-up conversation with government as to when that 75 gram is going to reduce. So we need, as we have with the company car tax system, a very clear, well-signaled long-term strategy on that. Then looking at the ultra-low emitting bands, again, it's great that the government are looking ahead. They're thinking about what are the tax bands going to look like post-2021. So we very much welcome the consultation. And again, what they've done is they've announced that they are now looking at the ultra-low emitting vehicles, the, the vehicles that are below 50 grams. Now they've introduced six new bands in that area. So they're now looking at, interestingly, is the capability, the zero emission miles capability of the vehicles, where you, you've got a range of different bands, which again, we'll hear a little bit more confirmed details on that, but it's going to be a range between um, whether the car can do 20, 30 miles right up to um, 170 plus miles, where for the, the ones that are capable of doing more zero emission miles will be paying less tax, and the ones that are capable of doing shorter miles paying a higher tax, so it's between 2% to 14%. And again, we welcome the, 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 the granular, again, question of complexity. You know, this is going to add another layer of complexity. So it's just the practical operation. How can we convert that into something tangible for you and your customers? In particular, we were talking yesterday about system changes and planning for that. So that's going to add a layer of complexity, which we'll need to think about. But what was a little bit surprising for us is that we, particularly around the electric vehicles, and as you heard this morning, the government is already behind its own stated targets on the number of electric vehicles or low, low emitting vehicles it needs on the roads. So we're a little bit surprised where, if you look at 2019, where the, the final tax ban sort of comes to an end, someone who takes an electric vehicle will be paying up to 16% of the list price. Yet that then drops immediately the following year to 2%. So again, I, we don't think the government have thought about this very logically because it will re result in people putting off decisions in taking the ultra low emitter, waiting for the, the lower tax ban to emerge. So what we'll be calling for is perhaps this is a little um, too late. Why, don't, why not introduce that immediately? Why not start thinking about implementing that now where we're still at an embryonic stage? The audit committee, the House of Commons Select Committee has already criticized the government being way behind its own targets. So it's a good example where government can show leadership in bringing those um, bans earlier rather than waiting for 2021. And then uh, another good example of ill-informed um, tax changes is around the VED. And as, as you heard Jerry this, this, early on this morning talking about our particular concerns, it's, you know, we understand VD needs to change 75% or two thirds of the vehicles that are being registered pay no tax. So we know we, need, we need have, have, have to have a grown-up conversation. But the way they've implemented this, it's added layers of complexity, it's confusing, it's moving away from a, what we regard as a very progressive VED system. And again, it's hitting the daily rental sector, particularly those members that are selling vehicles in the first year pretty hard. And again, the, the modeling we've done is we believe that the, the first year rate will hit the changes in the first year rate, the so-called showroom tax, will hit data rental members of up to 30 million pound per annum. 
And again, it's confusing as to what will happen, what will incentivize the second-hand buyer as well. Um, and again, there's this compli another further complication around the supplement for, for vehicles costing more than £40,000. Again, we need, we need to make sure government understands this. But again, we need well clear signal step changes. So we know the tax bans are not going to stay where they are forever. So we need to have a grown up conversation of what the future tax bans are likely to look like so we can plan. So we are calling very clearly on government to, you know, it's a very complex, very messy um, set of rules that they're about to implement. It's, our view is we should defer this. Um, if not defer, why not phase it in? Why not bring in a gradual change in this? And again, for daily rental members in the first year, the rule, refund rules are changing. We're simply saying that the taxpayer should be entitled to the unused portion of the VD. They, they should be entitled to the tax they've paid for the vehicle that they're not using. And again, that's the principle I think we should, we should pursue. So looking at some of the tax changes, we've talked about the, 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 the changes around the benefit in kind and the... Uh, um, flexible benefits. We've talked about the, the ULEV bans post-2020. Lease accounting, for those that aren't familiar, that, you know, this is where assets will be put on customer's balance sheet. Now, the taxman has not missed the trick. The taxman is looking at the difference between an operating and a finance lease being consigned to the history books. So how will they tax leases in the future? And again, we responded to a discussion paper around, around that where we are simply calling for a grown-up conversation here. Again, we know Things are changing, and again, having an opportunity to think about the unfairness of the current system where members are reporting to us the capital allowance system does not work for us. It's the largest cost of, of sale depreciating. And the, 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 the allowances that are available, quite often we're deferring way after we've sold the vehicles. One member has advised that they're still claiming deferred taxes up to 20 years after they've sold the vehicle. So there's an opportunity here to move away from capital allowances to, to something which is more realistic for, for your businesses is move towards commercial depreciation. Again, we'll be pushing very hard. And again, there was an, um, a consultation um, document, a recommendation from the Office of Tax Simplification, where they're now saying, actually, the current tax system is very complex. You can simplify it by looking at NICs on BICs. Again, that's one we should look out for, because that's going to have a huge impact if, we'd, if the government get, implements that and it, without really discussing that with the fleet sector. And again, some of the other areas I think we need to think about is we, we still haven't heard clarity on the 50% block. We have put in a very robust and a compelling case to government. Where in fact, we think we need to move away from the current 50%. In fact, it should be, business should be able to claim 60%, not 50%. Um, we'll wait and see. Again, we're pushing very hard to get some clarity before the year end. There is the you know, post AstraZeneca for those that have been following where there is a question the government's asking as to whether or not the supply from the employer to the employees of supply of service, whether that should be taxed as well. So there's a debate around that, that that's currently going on. And the other one to look out for, as cars are getting greener, we're filling up less. So again, there's a future challenge. We know that's not going to go away, is what, what's going to happen to fuel duty. You know, so we need to have a very proactive forward-looking agenda with government on, on that area as well. So one of the things we're going to be doing um, is certainly to take the fight to government to really sort of inform them. Um, there's some very, very big numbers about, you know, we, we're looking at Brexit, as you've heard, talent in the UK, and company cars are a good way of rewarding um, the right behaviours. It's rewarding um, the safer, greener cars to, to, to employees in the UK. And again, it's retaining that talent pool in the UK. The, the UK fleet sector makes a tax contribution of £5.2 billion. And again, that's a grown-up conversation we are making. We're not dodging the tax. We're simply trying to have a fair and equitable treatment to the way future taxation policy develops. We're supporting UK jobs up and down the country. Over 300 17,000 jobs rely on this sector. And again, 80% of cars that are sold in the UK are, um, that are purchased by our members are UK built. And again, that's a very strong message we can take to the government about supporting the U UK um, car industry. And again, when you look at that, that's an economic contribution that we're making of 24 billion pounds, a big number, which I think the government has to stand up and listen to as to the significance, but getting some of those policy changes incorrect could start to have a real disruption 
to a number of factors. So the BVLA really wants to, as, as you heard earlier on in Toby's session, if they don't get this right, then the disbenefits, i.e. what will people do if they don't have access to a company car? It's so obvious, you know, that they will get into more polluting vehicles, whether, whether it's cash allowance, whether it's the grey fleet, or, or, or generally the UK car fleet. They're, compared to the UK fleet that, they, that the BVLA membership operates, the alternative, it's going to start to really, really impact on the government's own environmental agenda. So again, putting the right incentives early in, well signal, will help the government achieve some of its policy changes. Again, BVLA will be very proactive in sharing some of the significant role we can play and how we can help the government deploy some of its own policy agendas. And we'll be talking to both senior members of parliament, but also importantly, what we've noticed is by activating your local MPs, getting them more involved at a grassroots level, helps to really energise the discussions across, across government. And it's, I think it's a real opportunity for us to develop a strong partnership with government to help demonstrate how this sector can help the government deploy its own policy agenda. But we need clear, progressive um, and, and forward-looking policies to achieve what I call a triple win. A win for the government, a win for the economy, and importantly, the win for the taxpayer. And again, the BVL is going to be urging the government to adopt a pro-enterprise agenda towards the rental and leasing sector. You know, this sector is, stands ready to help innovate, drive, jo drive job creation, and also support UK prosperity as we help to provide safer roads, greener and cleaner cities. Thank you.